Good evening, everyone. I am so excited today because I have a fabulous guest to introduce you to. Um, but before we get started with that, I want to show her TEDx talk for anybody that hasn't seen it. So if you can bear with me while I share my screen so we can see this talk and then we can get right into it. First, Papa, Papa going with that axe, axe, said further, said further her, mother, her mother as they were setting, they were setting the, table the table for breakfast. breakfast. Fern's, Fern's mother, mother explains that a piglet was going to run and is unlikely to survive. survive. Father, father intends to, to kill, kill him. him. Fern, Fern runs outside. outside. Please don't kill him. It's unfair. He couldn't help being born small, could he? If I had been very small at birth, would you have killed me? Certainly not. A little girl is one thing. A runty little pig is another. I see no difference. This is the most terrible case of injustice I've ever heard of. Maybe it was those lines from Charlotte's Web that made an impact on me as a child. Just as Charlotte's Web was woven to save Wilbur's life, my mind started to think about how we are all connected. Or maybe it was Disney's fault for helping me see and hear Bambi's fear after losing his mother to a hunter or the tears streaming down Dembo's face as his mother caressed him with her trunk when she was chained in the circus car. It could have been growing up in Texas and seeing the cows in the fields and imagining what would it be like if one of them didn't come home because of my hamburger, the worry, the fear the others would experience. Or perhaps it was my parents' divorce. I can't say there was just one thing that started me thinking about the families of all sentient beings, but it is a part of who I am and helps form the choices that I make in my life. The thought of losing my mom or one of my sisters was a real fear for me growing up. I was even hurt when my sisters went away to college. This was my family. I didn't want us to be separated. Whatever the cause, I decided at a young age that I would help make choices that would minimize the suffering of sentient beings, such as wearing non-leather boots. If you remember one thing from my talk today, let it be this. Uninformed food choices can contribute to the suffering of sentient beings. Therefore, your food choices can change the world. I went vegetarian for the first time when I was young. And my, my mother told me that the chicken I was eating was, well, a chicken. I remember being in line in elementary school in the cafeteria and asking the server not to put meat on my cheese enchiladas. She asked if I was a vegetarian. In my young mind, I wondered why she thought I was old enough to take care of sick dogs and cats. I told her no. When I was a teenager, I was able to stick with my commitment better. My mom would make me a separate meal, such as enchiladas with corn inside. When I was in high school, she just learned to make quiche. And then I went vegan. She said, I give up. I told her I'll eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day if I have to to stick with my commitment to go vegan. Over time, I've learned more about the tragedy of the separation of these animals and the bonds that exist when they're together. And I've adjusted my choices not to contribute to this. Mother cows used in the dairy industry have their babies taken away from them after birth because these large, magnificent mothers will fight to be with their babies. In southern Georgia, I had the heartbreaking opportunity to videotape a mother cow crying after she'd been separated from her baby. Her calf would bellow, and she would respond. I sat in a meeting with a small dairy farmer from Washington who told a story about a cow who had enough of him taking her babies away. According to him, the cow had given birth to twins, and when he couldn't find one of them, he went looking. He eventually found that she'd hidden one of them. According to him, she was trying to protect her baby. I've since learned this happens often. But it's not just cows. Pregnant pigs in a more natural environment build nests before they give birth, collecting branches in their mouths. Mother hens will use different vocalizations to protect their chicks from predators. Just like any mother, they want to protect their babies from harm. And just like human animals, these animals feel pain. We are so detached from animals in our society, 
and we are also so detached from the means in which our food is produced. I eventually made a decision that I wanted to focus my energy on our food choices and how they can make a difference. We eat several times a day, and each food choice says something about ourselves. I believe our individual food choices and collective voices can have an impact. By going vegan, I knew I was doing my part not to contribute to the suffering of non-human animals. But what about my food? What about the farm workers? I could simply stop eating animals as a means of not contributing to their suffering, but it's not as easy with farm workers. Everyone needs their fruits and vegetables. In the U.S., millions of farm workers pick our food, not just the food of vegans, but all of our food. It is estimated that approximately 400,000 of these farm workers are children. In California, many farm workers live in substandard labor camps, are homeless along our creeks and our rivers. They don't make enough to put a roof over their head, and yet they put food on our plates. They work in extreme temperatures, exposed to agricultural chemicals. Many can't even afford or have access to the types of fruits and vegetables they're picking. It is estimated in California that the average lifespan of a strawberry picker is 49 years.、Mm. Groups like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers are making great strides in this area by using consumer pressure to get corporations to make changes, such as getting tomato buyers to pay just a penny more per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. My organization, Food Empowerment Project. Organize a school supply drive to help with the education of the children of farm workers, so that they could choose an easier life. I still struggle with what more I can do. When people eat chocolate, they are eating my flesh. That is what one former slave told a reporter when he was asked what he would say to Westerners who eat chocolate. In West Africa, 1.8 million children in Ghana and the Ivory Coast are victims of the worst forms of child labor, all while picking cocoa for the chocolate industry. Here, they are forced to work with dangerous equipment such as machetes. Some children, as young as seven years old, many children have been documented with scars on their arms and their legs. If they don't move fast enough. While carrying these heavy cacao pods, they are beaten. Many children are locked in overnight, and if they try to escape, they're beaten or killed. We all have families, biological or not. So let's make choices that respect families and the bonds that they share. How can we do this? If you have access to fresh produce, go vegan. Support the rights of farm workers through legislation and corporate campaigns, and stop eating chocolate. Okay, okay, okay. You don't have to stop eating chocolate, but please only buy chocolate that's not sourced from the worst forms of child labor in West Africa. You can use our list at foodispower.org. I make the most informed food choices that I can make because I want to lessen the suffering of sentient beings. To me, I wanted to turn this pain I felt into power. So much of this has been about loss, and what I gained was a feeling that I could make a difference. I hope you will join me and put your ethics where your mouth is. To me, these issues are as connected as Charlotte's Web. You and your food choices can change the world and mitigate suffering the world over. Thank you. All right, everyone. That is Lauren Arnellis. Thank you for joining us. Your food choices can change the world. Food Empowerment Project seeks to create a more just and sustainable world by recognizing the power of one's food choices. Thank you for taking the time out to join us today, Lauren. I'm so happy that、uh, you were here to、um, talk with me.、Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, so tell me the story. How did food empowerment start? Your your vegan journey and the organization. Sure. I mean, you heard about my vegan journey.、Um, basically, you know, by the time I, 1988 rolled around and I was in high school, I decided, you know, I was going to go vegan.、Um, growing up in Texas, it wasn't the easiest thing to do、uh -huh. in the、uh, <laughs> late 80s.、Um, but you know, it was it was about the animals. And that always keeps 
I think most of us strong when things get difficult in terms of people not understanding our choices. But, um, you know, and I decided, you know, I went to college to do animal rights work. And, you know, that is what I wanted to do was to, to help the animals. But because of my upbringing and because of my own life experiences, um, I always also worked on human rights issues, whether that be for the farm workers or it be, you know, the anti-apartheid movement or any worker issue or being a very proud Chicana, you know, working on our issues as well. And, you know, over the years of doing animal rights work and kind of starting to talk about these issues as well, I think it really culminated in 2000 when I learned about what was happening in Western Africa for chocolate. And even though I was running a vegan organization where I did investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses, I would sometimes talk about what was taking place. And I received a lot of pushback from other animal rights activists and vegans telling me that I was hurting the animals. Uh, by talking about human rights issues as well. Really? So, yeah. Um, so in 2006, I spoke at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela, where I talked about you know corporate animal ag and how it impacted the animals, the environment, and workers and communities. And you know, I was asked like, you know, what organization works on all of this? And I didn't know of any. But what I was feeling when I was at this this event was people from all over the world who looked like me, um, who were wanting to fight for justice and doing it in a way that that noticed these issues were connected. It wasn't like, oh, this is this issue, this takes place here. It was like all of these issues were being discussed in this international forum. And that kind of helped me decide that I wanted to start an organization that that's mission looked at these issues as equal in terms of it's not choosing one or the other, that we can say these issues are connected and we need to fight for all of them, human and non-human animals alike. And that's what really led me to starting Food Empowerment Project. Uh, yeah, and I heard you're doing amazing, amazing work. The plant-based industry has grown a billion dollars since the pandemic started. Do you think veganism will grow because of meat concerns, whether it's for the human rights uh, issues, animals, environment, or even for people that are concerned about their health? Honestly, I have no statistics to back this up, but I really feel like a lot of it is the younger generation. Um, ah, they okay. are becoming informed. They are willing to look past what has been. They're not willing to just hear this is the way we've done it. They're looking at it and saying, well, this isn't right and it shouldn't be this way. And we're seeing this with a variety of issues. And I think that they have influence on marketplaces. They have influence with their parents. And they have influence even with media in terms of like TV shows and things like that. So I think that obviously people are concerned about COVID-19. There's a lot of different reasons why people are turning to veganism. Um, but I think a lot of it's the young people. And I would have to say that having gone vegan in Texas in the 80s, I would say that our food has improved greatly as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing. Um, is ve do you think veganism is the key to avoiding the next pandemic? Um, I don't, I, again, I guess because the way I look at things, I think it's all connected, right? I mean, I think veganism and non-consumption of, you know, non-human animals can definitely contribute. But I think that there's so many other things at play here, which all focuses in my mind to one thing, and that's looking out for each other. So if there's a pandemic going on right now and people aren't wearing their masks, that may not change. But the more and more we get across to people that it's important for us to look out for each other and look out for other beings. I think that in that regard, veganism can be if, it be, if we become more compassionate, empathetic, and sensitive people to one another as well as to non-human animals. Yeah, we all have to try <laughs> love. We do that. Um, what do you think is the best way to provide or offer vegan and animal rights education in a city, a particular, you know, any city, a metro metropolitan, rural? What do you think is the, the best tactic in your mind? Well, I'm biased, obviously, because I created Food <laughs> Empowerment Project. Right. Um, but I, I guess, you know, again, in, in my biased opinion is that we need to do it in a way that's not siloed. We need to do it in a way to show that all these issues are connected and they're connected in a variety of ways in the sense that um, exploitation and oppression and injustice are kind of all strung from a similar thread. And we can't go in and think we can just talk about non-human animals without talking about the environment or workers and the, and the communities who are impacted 
by farms or talking about the fact that black and brown and indigenous communities are the most impacted by dietary diseases um, and why veganism can help with that. Talking about how colonization is, um, you know, again, something why many of us, what Food Empowerment Project calls lactose normal, um, that a lot of people are considered lactose intolerant without a recognition that milk is a form of colonization for many of us. Right. And so um, I think that when we talk about these issues, it's not saying that the animals are important. They are first and foremost important in terms of who's impacted, but we can't ignore the human workers that impacted. We can't ignore how colonization impacted, um, you know, black, brown and indigenous people and why, you know, to force dairy upon us is bad for us. So I think that going in with a holistic perspective um, is the way that we're gonna get um, more people to open their minds um, to, to veganism. What are your thoughts about what's going on right now with the Black Lives Matter movement and the intersection of veganism? I'm, I'm not sure that I know exactly what you mean. I'm sorry. Oh. I mean, I think what's happening with Black Lives Matter is phenomenal. Um, <laughs> so... There, there's like, okay, so we have Gwenna Hunter in, in LA who's created the uh, Vegans for Black Lives Matter group. And so there's a lot of uh, white allyship coming into that. What are your thoughts about that whole thing, about that ally, allyship and what should be going on? Um, well, in terms of the allyship from white vegans, I think that we need to see sincerity um, as a brown woman, this movement, I would say that I definitely have been treated different. And what I'm seeing now is a lot of what's called cosmetic diversity, where um, you're getting black, brown people put in positions, but they don't really have a lot of influence and power. Mm. Um, what these organizations should be doing is actually donating and giving money and talking to funders about giving money to groups that are run by black and brown, indigenous, if they exist, animal and vegan organizations, because I... I personally would rather have more black and brown run vegan and animal organizations than have our people working in a white dominated environment. Uh, right. we, we can run our own groups. We can do our own things. We can reach out to our communities. We simply don't have the funding that they have. So let's get the funding to us because we're going to have different perspectives about how to do things. Um, because we have different backgrounds. We come from different places and we just need the financial support to do it. You, you sound like I do, Lauren. Um, we, we have to be the face of the movement because, you know, people, they have to feel comfortable. They have to feel safe. Um, you know, we've been colonized and, and brainwashed for all these centuries. And I agree with you 100 percent on that 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 point. So there's a call out for support for food uh, empowerment project. Uh, write those checks. <laughs> so and you're an organization, too. You know what I mean? It's like. It's like, why I don't, I think that the funders that are out there should say, you know, instead of trying to get a, a white dominated vegan group to, oh, we'll give you money to hire and do projects reaching out to these communities. We're here. Right. We're here. We're here. The grass is doing the work. Because we're doing it. Yeah. Exactly. I 100%. I'm with you, sister, on that. <laughs> are, you, are you aware of the Boycott Meat uh, Coalition uh, where they're um, protecting uh, the, the workers and the animals and the environment? So the, the workers, you know, are, are being tested for COVID or they're being injured and, 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 and uh, a lot of things. So boycottmeat.com is the website. What are your thoughts on the coalition and, and what they're doing? Well, I'm very familiar with LULAC, um, which was founded in my, my home state of Texas. Um, but that is a coalition that we're not a part of. Um, our way of looking at this is that we don't believe that slaughterhouses are good for human or non-human animals, period. We don't want the animals in there and we do not want the workers in there either. Nobody should be doing what it is that those slaughterhouse workers are having to do. I've written a blog on why vegans need to be more compassionate to slaughterhouse workers who have been infected with COVID-19, and we got a huge backlash. In fact, vegans attacking us on social media, trying to impact the ratings of our Facebook page because we were talking about compassion to slaughterhouse workers. Um, so although we very much advocate and want um, the rights for, farm, for workers who work in slaughterhouses, 
we don't want them there to begin with. We want them to go through, you know, to have some type of just transition where they're finding able to find jobs. And that should be our role um, if people are actively in that coalition to help them find jobs that don't involve their well-being and their health and their mental health being impacted and working for companies that are being, threatening them with um, deportation um, or being arrested. I mean, if, if groups really want to speak out for slaughterhouse workers, then I hope that they stop promoting any type of an undercover investigation that then victimizes the slaughterhouse workers and then they get arrested or charged with animal abuse. Um, I think that we do a better job, you know, standing and, and telling other vegans, because that still needs to happen, um, that we need to be compassionate towards these slaughterhouse workers and understanding what it is that they're going through, but also take a look at our own food. We can't sit there and point the finger at slaughterhouse workers and act as if the workers who pick our food are treated just fine because they're not. That, that is a very good, good point, and you're definitely enlightening me on that because I've heard those type of things. You know, what is it really 100% cruelty free? You know, not just animals, but right. for, for people behind that are uh, assisting to get get this food or these products to us. So I really appreciate you bringing that conversation to light. Food is power.org again, food empowerment project. Um, what about this chocolate? I mean, <laughs> we were talking the chocolate yeah. issue. Uh, so Lauren has this chocolate list on her site. Food is in, uh, so food is power. Where it's a no no for some, and then it's a yes for others. And people really need to check out that list. You would be surprised. Let's talk about that. Yeah, and you know the video that you showed. Um, you know we've learned more since I did that talk that Brazil is one of the countries as well now that we don't openly um, recommend companies um, that are supplying from there either. We still have child labor and slavery going on in both uh, Western Africa and now Brazil. You have children who are being, you know, six to 16 years old being liberated from slavery um, within the past three years. You have some children like 10 year olds who are being sold for $10 a piece. Oh, wow. um, to work in the chocolate industry. So we're talking about slavery here, all for chocolate. And so our list that we created is basically companies that we feel comfortable recommending based on the country of origin. So we don't go based on any certification. It's literally, where is this, this um, cacao beans? Where is it sourced from? So some companies won't tell us. Um, mm. So on our list, we're very clear to say what companies we recommend, which ones we don't recommend and why, because we think transparency is incredibly important here, that everybody has a right to know if we don't recommend them because they're still sourcing from those areas, or are they thinking that they're, they're um, it's not as important to disclose country of origin, like they're, they're more important than having to tell us where their cacao is coming from. And to be clear, when we're asking for country of origin, we're not asking for what state it's coming from, what city it's coming from. It's literally the country. And they still say it's proprietary information, which is outrageous and insulting to what's happening um, to children and, and adults even who are um, being trafficked for the chocolate industry. Lauren, your organization is doing incredibly, incredibly important work. Um, and I can say for African-Americans and Latinos, this <laughs> chocolate list alone, since we want to give our children candy uh, <laughs> before they're the age of one, you really, really, really need to look into this and uh, go to their site and check this list out because chocolate can really be dangerous, not just to your health, but to someone else's life. So we really, really need to be in, in tune with this. Um, yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was it, that was definitely an eye opener for me. Yeah. Upcoming projects. What do you have on your plate right now? Well, uh, COVID nineteen, like for everybody, <laughs> has really impacted our work. Right. Um, but you know, the interesting about COVID nineteen is that it really seems to heighten the areas that we're working in, and really showed. Um, how the issues that we're working on are even more impacted. So for our work for the farm workers, uh, we you know reached out to the farm workers and asked them, what do you need right now during the you know COVID-19, what's happening in food? Um, we raised money and were able to donate food over ten thousand dollars with the food, vegan of course. Absolutely. And that, no to question. the farm workers. 
Um, and um, we're going to be doing our school supply drive for the children of farm workers. Um, so you'll in a few weeks, we'll be posting. You know, again, usually we get together a group of volunteers. We have drop off locations. We're not going to be able to do that this year. So we're going to be asking people to donate money to us and, and ship backpacks to us because we're going to not be able to do our usual, you know, 14 hour marathon days of, of stuffing the backpacks for the kids. We're going to have to get it pre-assembled and then stuff them and then drop them off. And we're not going to be able to be part of the delivery with the kids this year. Um, the farm worker organizations that they trust and that are closest to are going to be um, distributing the backpacks. Um, our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. Um, Vallejo is a community we've been working with in California that um, is pr primarily Black, um, Latinx, and Filipinx community members. Um, we do a food fest every year because we've been working on the community to try and get um, more access to healthy foods in those communities. Okay. Um, we've done an assessment. We did a report. We've done two reports um, at finding, you know, showing how bad the problem is in that community. But we've also done an event to celebrate the community and to have free vegan food available to them all day long um, so that they could just try vegan foods, a full meal we do every time, culturally appropriate. And we also um, have um, a Black and a Filipinx and a Latinx um, cooking demos um, and food that they have, as well as community groups. And obviously, we can't do that in person this year. Right. So we're going to be um, doing it virtually. And because our work is so focused just on that community and those community members, um, we're going to be able to do it in, in a way that brings them in. We're going to be able to, um, what we're, we're going to do is we're going to have um, boxes that people who sign up are going to get. And it's going to include like a free vegan cookbook. They're going to decide which vegan cookbook they want in it. But we're still going to have the cooking demos. We're still, we're still going to do all that stuff online. Um, but again, we'll just be connected more with the individuals. And um, yeah, we have a wonderful community organizer there named Erica Hazel. So or Erica Jordan, if you know her online-ness. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's our uh, community organizer. And so we're really excited that we're going to be able to do something in the future. Do you have a date for that? Or is that on the website? No not date yet. yet. Not but yet. It's, it's going to be in September. Website. Yeah, it's, okay. it'll but be it'll on the be website. Okay. We'll so even yeah. have bus signs on the buses telling people in English and in Spanish. I'm letting people in the community know about the event. Great, awesome, it's, it sounds great. Action plans, what does food empowerment uh, need? What What do you need? Um, how can I help? How can Landa Kush, how can Black yeah. Bitch help? What do you, how can everybody out there help if, if well, you're listening, what do you need? Okay, there's always so much. I think that we're still a very small organization. So I think that people spreading the word about our existence, um, like you're doing, thank you. Um, but making sure that people promote our work on social media, things like that are incredibly helpful because we only have so much of a reach. We're small. A lot of vegans maybe don't want to support our work because we talk about human rights issues as well. Um, so we, you know, we don't have as broad as a, of a reach as we might if we were just focusing on non-human animals and veganism. So those people who get that all of these issues are connected, we really need you to help promote our work. Um, Obviously, donations, as every, you know, black and brown and indigenous organization in this country needs. We need financial donations. And they can donate um, on your site, right? I think I did see. I saw donate. I saw veganism. I saw the chocolate. Yeah. Okay, so you can donate yeah. on the site, right on the site. You can go exactly. to foodispower.org and you can do all of that on the site. So I'll show it to you, everyone, again. Um, yes, checks. We like checks. <laughs> you want to support, send a check. And don't do this quid, poll crow, all this not. Just send a check, okay? Yeah. <laughs> what and else do you need? Share, share, share. Everybody <laughs> online want to share this video yeah. now um we have you know on our website we have 15 things that you can do to eat more ethically which would be great for people to check out we also have a petition on our website against a grocery store chain called safeway which is also known as albertson's and a couple of other names and what they are doing across the united states is they are placing what's called restrictive deeds on their former property um preventing other grocery stores from opening up. So in the community we're working in and other black and brown communities in the US, they'll be located in one location and they will shut down that location and they will relocate miles away. And what they do to their former property is they put what's called a restrictive deed on that and they state that no other grocery store can move into that location for X number of years. So in the community we're working in, they prevented a grocery store from moving in for 15 years. 
Why another person that? That. just the corner of the market to where they're going uh, okay that that okay that and i had heard something about that and i yeah. questioned like why would it, is that for marketing but then that area becomes a food desert and we don't want any more food deserts no. yeah that that okay what <laughs> We have a petition on our website that we're asking people to, to sign. sign Again, we were going out in front of their stores, which we won't be able to do now. Um, so for now, we're thinking of, you know, just try and help us get that petition out. Um, we need to get more signatures. We need Safeway Albertsons to understand that harming the health of communities is not okay. And um, it's a form of, um, you know, environmental racism to prevent yeah. our communities from being able yeah. to access healthy food. Yes, it is. No more food desert Safeway. That's that's not nice. Yeah, exactly. Sign the petition, everybody. Foodispower.org. Please, please, please. Um, how do restricted deeds help Safeway? That seems counterintuitive because they're probably trying to move the people to go shopping where that wherever they're gonna that you know that yeah. prevents another shop from opening up in that spot so they can and go to the other spot despite the fact that they've just created a food desert you know and I yeah. can research that a little bit more but from a marketing uh, perspective mm -hmm. that's what I believe that strategy is but 15 years I mean that that is just really ridiculous so yeah we need to sign that petition absolutely I don't even remember the last time I you know but anyway um oh Tom said hi hi Lauren hi Nadja hi Tom. hi Tom what else can we do Lauren um, you know, just thinking off, you know, the, the list of things that we encourage people to do is just, you know, really think about um, what you're buying and what you're eating. I mean, for those of us that have the privilege of eating several times a day, that, that comes with responsibility and making sure that what we eat um, represents our ethics and what we believe in. Um, our list on things you can do is like, you know, obviously, if you have access to healthy foods, go vegan, use our chocolate list, um, support. Um, well, I guess I'll say this. We really encourage people to support the corporate campaigns called by farm workers, asking the coalition of Immokalee workers are asking for a boycott of Wendy's. Um, who cares if they have a veggie burger or not? Um, people should be boycotting Wendy's for the fact that they won't pay farm workers one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. Oh, really? And, Definitely. I didn't even know they had a veggie burger. That just goes yeah. to show you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, and the, there's th thanking theme farm workers in Mexico who are asking us to boycott Driscoll berries because wow. of Driscoll berries wage theft and other problems that are happening that they're asking us to um, boycott. So really, just making sure that what we do, what we can do in terms of you know, we, I, I can't say okay, don't eat produce. So just asking us to make sure that those campaigns called by farm workers themselves that we respect those. I appreciate that. Um, I want to take this time to tell everybody, please subscribe to NajaSpeaks.com. Um, this video will be replayed right literally after it ends on the Jane Unchained platform, Land of Kush, Vegan Soul Fest, Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland, and then it'll be available tomorrow on my YouTube channel, <laughs> NajaSpeaks.com. So please, please, please um, support Food Empowerment Project. The website is foodispower.org any last words or messages that you want to pierce through our viewers right now that before you leave, you want to make sure you get out, Lauren? First of all, I want to thank you. Um, and very oh. thankful that you have a platform. Um, you know, it's very important that uh, black, brown, indigenous women have platforms to talk about the issues that were very, that, that matter to our communities. Um, but I think that, you know, more than anything is just hoping that people recognize that you know, we have responsibility. There's a lot of things going on in this world and we need to, you know, again, it's not just about going vegan or not just about using our chocolate list. It's making sure that we speak up and that we use our voices to help create change because um, if we don't do it, no one's going to. And I think that's the, the positive thing that's happening right now, whether it be the Black Lives Matter movement um, or any other young people who are out there as well as the Black Lives Matter movement, really going out there and demanding change because enough is enough. Ya basta. You know, yeah, we got there's change. no joke. They're, they're, no, they're doing it to us in the restaurant. So we already know. <laughs> the yeah. They are definitely moving this nation 
uh, forward. And, and that's a good thing. I'm going to have Genesis Butler on uh, Thursday mm -hmm. to talk about what she's doing with the social justice schools. I, I mean, when I read that, I, I thought that was amazing. So we definitely want to talk to her and uh, get her message out there and hear that story. So it's, it's been Absolutely. a pleasure. I mean, those were all the Thank questions you. that I have for you, the most important questions. Um, and please, whatever you need from us on, on our end, Landa Kush from me, from Black Veg, you know, you can feel free to reach out. Um, you got my number. Okay. Thank I appreciate you. you taking the time out, Lauren. Get those checkbook out foundations <laughs> and send that money to Food Empowerment Project. Um, don't be cheap and don't be asking to be in the festival and all other stuff. Um, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> Appreciate you, Lauren. Thank you. I Thanks, everybody. You. Enjoy Take the rest care. of your evening. <laughs> Have a good one.